How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. So I read this book a while back and I went back and revisited it again. And I realized that these principles that are covered in the book, which we're going to go and I'm going to share my reflections, deep dive analysis on, are timeless and can be built upon and studied and revisited over and over and over again to be able to help you get more success when it comes to connecting with people, meeting new people, connecting with people for a business or personal level or whatever level you want. Pretty much the most important thing that you could do is connect and relate with people because if you can do that, you can work together to further whatever your objective is. So it's worth revisiting this book regularly and consider it kind of like a manual. So as you're going about your days, you refer back to the book, refer back to this video because I'm going to give you different perspectives that are not covered in the book from personal experience and really make this a lifelong study and that'll be really beneficial. So let's talk about first the eight things that this book will help you achieve. So number one, it'll help you get out of a mental rut, think new thoughts, acquire new visions, and discover new ambitions. If you want to increase the success that you have in whatever area of your life, you have to change the way you think. Your current way of thinking has brought you to this point. And while you might be happy or maybe you're not happy where you are right now, it's really largely dependent on your way of thinking. So when you come across material like this that changes the way you think, and specifically changes the way you think when it comes to dealing with people, then you're gonna find it to be really beneficial because the way of thinking will change your actions and your behaviors, which will change your results. And because I've been involved with business for about six years, 10 years in corporate, I've dedicated a large part of my life to developing communication and persuasion and connection skills with not just one-on-one, but in groups of people. Um, my thinking has changed dramatically throughout the years. How I see reality, how I see communicating with people is considerably different than when I started on this journey, and it continues to evolve, it continues to change as I not only reread some of these books that I have once read back in the days, but also build upon by taking a lot of notes and analyzing not just how people respond, uh, but how I respond to what people say or do and i make this a lifelong study and thus my way of thinking gets changed and evolved over and over again and this is what this book helps with also number two it helps you make friends quickly and easily you want to make friends for many different reasons just for social reasons sometimes sometimes for um, dating and relationships you want to make friends because you want to further your business and it's not just making a lot of friends but also building meaningful connections with people, Uh, connections in a way where you offer a lot of value to them and they reciprocate that value to you and you're able to move forward towards a positive win-win objective. This will also increase your popularity and again not in a superficial way but in a way that speaks and connects to the group of people that you're interested in connecting with and offering value. For example, um, business is a very diverse, huge realm, and there's a lot of sections of business, different kinds of industries, and different kind of industries have sub-industries. And each one of those industries or sub-industries have diverse groups of people that have different ways of thinking, belief systems, etc. You need to be able to figure out first the kind of people that you want to connect with, and then when you connect with them, how to build meaningful relationships, okay? Not just like superficial relationships, but meaningful relationships shouldn't be aiming to build superficial relationships deep connections and you'll find that you don't have to have a lot of friends you want to have friends that have different perspectives different insights different ways of looking at things so they can expand your way of thinking but you also want to have friends that will further your objectives your very clear-cut objectives and that you can also contribute to them Uh, Next, you'll win people into to your way of thinking. And this is not talking about manipulating and forcing people to see things your way and adopt your ideologies, but rather 
exploring what other people are doing and their ways of thinking and then sharing your ways of thinking in a way that's impactful to the point where they consider your way of thinking and then even ask you how to implement your way of thinking because they find that it'll be beneficial for them. Next, it will increase your influence, your prestige, and your ability to get things done. Pretty much like all the results that you're going to have in your life is going to become um, uh, is going to be a net result of working with other people. But in order to work successfully with other people, you have to be able to connect with them. You have to be able to um, build a relationship with them, and you have to make sure that they are genuinely and authentically motivated to further your grand strategy because they realize by doing so, they will further their own grand strategy. Next, uh, how to handle complaints, avoid arguments, and keep your human contact smooth and pleasant because when we're interacting with people, we want to be pleasant, we want to be smooth, and sometimes it can be polarizing, but we definitely don't want to steer up unnecessary resistance and anger in people because that could be draining for both parties. Next, you become a better speaker and a more entertaining conversationalist. To become more interesting, you have to go through a process. You have to go through a process where you study this material, you implement it, you learn how people respond to different things, you learn uh, the different ways of thinking and how to accept people for who they are. And all these things, and there's many more aspects to it, makes you a better clearer, more concise, and calibrated communicator, and you'll know how to chunk up and chunk down uh, to different levels of granularity and higher levels of abstraction based on who you're connecting with. And what I mean by that is not everybody needs the message delivered the same way. Some people deserve it, not deserve it, but uh, need to get the message in a more uh, step-by-step manner. Some people need to uh, just have a story presented to them so they could piece it all together. Everybody communicates different, uh, differently and they're all at different levels. But as you go through this journey, you learn how to communicate to a wider array of people and specifically to individuals in a way, even through videos like this, where it feels to them like you're speaking directly to them. Next, arouse enthusiasm amongst your associates. So part of communication, and actually a large part of communication is how you present the information and the place it's coming from. It's not so much what you say, but how you say it, the vibe, the energy, the tonality, all the different aspects that make those words that you're saying more impactful to the other person. And um, just as I'm looking at this right now, I'm becoming more aware. And this is part of the journey. The more you practice these things, the more aware you become of how you're communicating and implementing all these things covered in the book. So now let's talk about, there's four parts to this book. Number one, the fundamental techniques in handling people. So principle number one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. If you criticize excessively, condemn, and complain, then you will put up unnecessary resistance in the other person. If you're trying to connect with people and build relationships with them, then that resistance works against you. Now, there's times where conflict actually furthers the relationship, but for the most part, you want to try to reduce the amount of complaining because not only is it going to put up the resistance, but it's also going to drain the other person. Your job is to energize and bring value to the other person, not drain them. Nobody wants to walk around feeling that everybody that comes up to them and talks to them wants a piece of them, wants to drain them. They like to walk around and feel that there's all these people that want to give them value, that uplift them. You want to be the kind of person that uplifts people. And one of the fastest way to violate that is to criticize, condemn, and complain and carry that in your energy. Because I mentioned this earlier, it's not so much what you say but how you say it. You can, you can essentially criticize and offer constructive criticism in a way where the other person feels energized doing it, okay? You could do it, it's the vibe of how you say it, but if you're looking to put people down, if you're looking to bring people down, if you're trying to make them look bad so you could feel yourself 
becoming more superior in your delusional mind as a result because you know you're not actually doing that it's just a delusion that we have um, then you're not coming from the right place okay so you always come from a place of bringing the good vibe number two give honest and sincere appreciation um, most people don't get honest and sincere appreciation they might get superficial recognition and appreci uh, appreciation so you have to be able to give honest appreciation for not the obvious things they do a lot of times, but the not so obvious areas of their life where they don't get a lot of appreciation. Number three, arouse in the other person an eager want. You can't tell people what they should want. You need to figure out what they want and then connect what you have to offer in a way that fits with what they want. Okay, so don't tell people what they want, but rather take a lot of time to understand, listen, evaluate, recognize, and understand the person that you're connecting with, and then figure out how you can relate what it is you're offering. You have a lot to offer and a lot of different things, whether it's business, social, uh, vibe, energy. Custom fit that to what the other person wants, and they will eagerly await your reawait your presence they will be excited to pick up the phone when you call them when you text message them when you reach out to them when you send them a communication they're excited to get it they don't feel like you're draining them okay that's what you call eager want part number two ways to make people like you so number one principle begin or oh, sorry become genuinely interested in other people if you want to become a better communicator, if you want to be uh, the kind of person that has a lot of influential people in their lives and um, very well respected and popular amongst your peer group, you have to be interested in people and not just the people that you're trying to connect with, but people in general. And one of the best ways that I found, just because I, I came from a more introverted background and now I'm extroverted, I draw a lot of energy from connecting with people, is I'm fascinated by how people do things, how they think, how they uh, just live life. And I travel a lot. I've been to many different countries. I love hanging around with people who have diverse ways of thinking. A lot of times these people don't share the same ideologies that I do, but I love understanding their ideologies. Because by understanding their ideologies, I get more data, more insights to be able to further my own objective. So it's actually very exciting. But then when I connect with a different people, I'm able to offer value in terms of perspective and ways of looking at things that they would never have from another person who was not genuinely interested in people. So you have to be genuinely interested in people in general okay just everybody try to get as interested as possible to learning about many different viewpoints that you don't necessarily agree with that's probably one of the biggest uh, most profound impactful internal changes that I've experienced in my life is being genuinely interested in people that don't share my same viewpoints. Number two, smile. One of the things that I realized is that uh, when I go through phases where I work really hard and I'm just very isolated and I'm just like doing my business stuff, I can become very serious. And then I recognize that and then I go out and socialize and you know I'm connecting with people and building relationships, etc. And then I start to naturally carry myself in a way where I smile more. And I notice, and right now I'm more of a balance of the two, like I've learned to balance my life out. But I've noticed a difference of how the world responds to me um, in the first category or the second category. Like, for example, when I'm very serious, the world tends to reflect the seriousness in me. That's because we have mirror neurons in our brain. So whatever we put out, whatever we're projecting, whatever kind of energy we're projecting, um, and the smile is really a heartfelt smile. It's not like a fake smile. Uh, so if you're, if you're kind of projecting an uh, authentic smile, and the people who are in front of you will reflect that back to you. And that will make for less resistance when you're connecting with people. If you're very serious and you're kind of 
very uh, harsh and you know, just very in your head, you're going to get that kind of energy reciprocated from the people. Like, you know, they might not necessarily be like that, but when they see you, they might just all of a sudden reflect that energy back to you and then you can get even more in your head about it. So it's not a good place to be. So always observe yourself to see if you're carrying your, yourself uh, a very lightheartedness. It doesn't have to be an exact, I mean, it shouldn't be an exaggerated smile, but it should be, um, you know, a pleasantness to you that brings out an authentic smile. And if you do that, then it's not only very disarming, but it's an indication of you being very balanced. Principle number three, remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. One of the things that I try to do is as soon as I meet somebody, I try to learn their name. And then I try to use their name in a wide array of context, uh, contexts so I can remember their name. But not only that, um, to show them that I really value our connection. I don't meet people for the sake of meeting people. I really meet people because I like to connect and explore and understand and see things their way and figure out if I've got some value to offer them or if you've got something that we can do together that we find mutually beneficial. Um, but I want them to understand that this is not a superficial connection. It's a, it's a meaningful connection. And the best way to do this is to say their name. So learn their names and say their names because a lot of times uh, if you if you somebody gives you their name and you don't remember their name and you have to ask them for their name again, it shows that you weren't really present, that you weren't really paying attention, and it, and it breaks the connection. So principle number four, be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. They love to share and express their viewpoints, their ideologies, their ways of doing things, their life experiences, what happened yesterday, the things that they're interested in. They love to do it because it makes them feel good. And if you can stay there and listen and understand and ask questions and be genuinely interested in them, they're gonna relate that good feeling back to you. And they're gonna see you as the person that is interesting, right? There's a saying from Stephen R. Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you want, um, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Or you could say, if you wanna be uh, the most interesting person be the most interested. There's many ways of looking at it, but essentially it's really just the feeling that they're reflecting back to you and relating and anchoring to you because you make them feel good by listening to people. And, and you know, listening to people share their perspectives and their stories and not being judgmental about it, just being open to it, is an, it requires an enormous amount of presence and self-confidence, which again makes the other person feel good because we like being around self-confident people, but it also gives you a lot of information, a lot of objective data, a lot of uh, insight as to what the person really is thinking and what they're interested in. Like really, instead of what you're thinking that they're interested in or what you think they should be interested in, you're really getting valuable information. Information then which you could use to further the conversation that you're having with them in a way that they feel that you're the only person in the world that understands them to that level. And that's really a net result of listening. Uh, principle number five, talk in terms of the other person's interests. Again, if you listen to what a person is interested in and you talk about those things that they're interested in in a way that is connected to your goals and what you're interested in, then you've got a powerful connection. See, when people present things to me, I always try to get really fascinated by whatever it is they're interested in. Even if I'm not necessarily interested in it at a surface level, I try to find a deeper uh, level of connection to what they're interested in. So if they talk to me about um, sports or like uh, you know soccer games or whatever, that's Euro Cup, whatever is going on, on the surface level, I'm not really interested in, I don't really follow. I try to share that passion with them anyways. I try to you know, figure out how what they're sharing with me is related to what I'm interested in and I further the conversation. There's many artful ways of doing it, but that passion that they're presenting to me, I try to take that passion in and reflect it back and that's what makes the connection. Now, if you can do that, it doesn't mean you have to do that all the time. If you do that enough, they're most likely going to be interested in you when you're sharing 
what you're interested in. Uh, number six, make the other person feel important and do it sincerely. Um, a lot of people in, in, especially Western society, we're just so caught up in the day to day activities that we can give off this vibe, making other people feel like um, they're not important and that we're important. And the reality is that just displays a lack of control in life and a lack of self-confidence and a lack of presence. People that are at a really high level, when you're around them, they make you feel like you are the most important person in their lives. They don't try to make themselves feel important because they already realize the value they bring and they don't need to, to prove anything. So they take the best thing they could possibly do at that time and they make it all about you because by making it all about you, they learn more. They're constantly learning. There's a reason why they're at a higher level is because they're constantly learning. And you don't learn by putting up resistance in the other person. You learn by allowing the other person to open up. Now, this doesn't mean that they you know, spend uh, time, like every moment of their, uh, of their time listening to people. Well, when they do find the opportunity to be in front of somebody, they remain fully present. And they don't need to um, think about being somewhere else. So you have a considerable advantage when you're connecting with people to be fully present and understand and listen and feel the energy that's being communicated at a deeper level, just totally being present. Um, you could totally feel it and that's gonna make the other person seem uh, valued and feel important, but they're also gonna look at you like you're important because you are, because who really does those kind of things, right? It's only the rare, highly confident, highly evolved people that take the time to appreciate because the reality is the most important person in your life is the person in front of you right now. Part three, how to win people to your way of thinking. So I make a lot of videos on this channel about persuasion, communication in a way that creates behavioral change in a way that's win-win because uh, persuasion is a very important skill. If you're in sales, marketing, business, uh, in life in general, if you know how to persuade people ethically to a win-win outcome, you're going to have tremendous success. You're also going to be very valued um, in your peer groups when you're around people because uh, you're always creating win-win scenarios everywhere you go. So you want to win people over to your way of thinking, but at the same time, you don't want to be angry and forceful and commanding and manipulative about it because if you are, you will hit these unconscious triggers of resistance and you'll make the person feel like you don't care. Remember, this is about win-win here. So let's look at the principles. Number one, the only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. So arguments create unnecessary resistance. So if you could avoid the argument and if you can think more like a billiards player, as my mentor Jay Abraham puts it, of how to preemptively help people get to an outcome or an idea, without hitting the resistance and uh, do it in a way where they feel empowered and they're excited to go on this journey with you to that realization, and then that's what you want to do. And arguments create unnecessary resistance. And a lot of times when you argue with someone, let's say you just keep arguing with a person and you just kind of, you know, overpower them with your energy and you just, they just surrender. They might just surrender because they just want you to get, they just want to get you to shut up and you didn't actually change their viewpoint. So essentially, you've wasted a lot of energy and they've wasted a lot of energy and they realize that they've wasted a lot of energy and they'll probably not want to associate with you any uh, very much because they realize that it's just really draining to to communicate with you you want to be able to be the kind of person that brings a lot of energy not takes it and by having excessive amounts of arguments you are taking the energy and you're unpleasant to be around um, and you're also not very persuasive because it's a sign of lack of confidence a confident person knows how to get the outcome without creating a lot of resistance. And uh, this takes practice and skill, um, very complicated process, um, but it's also simplistic in a way. And that's why I make a lot of videos discussing it and I'll make a lot more videos discussing it. And that's why books like this will help further your ability to do it in a way where it's not defensive and argumentative with the other person. Principle number two, show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say you're wrong. You know, what I've realized in life is that there's probably a situation 
where you take like the wrongest thing you could possibly think of, there's probably a situation where that's okay. Or think of a person that you've argued with recently and they were um, very apparently wrong about the thing. Uh, if you kind of deeply reflect upon it, you'll probably realize that the reason why you think you're, they were wrong is because you were thinking of a scenario in your mind and you thought because uh, you, you thought that what they were referring to is that scenario or and they were wrong about that scenario. So therefore, you labeled them as wrong. And the reality is that most communication is miscommunication and maybe they just can't communicate to you in a way that you understand uh, where their situation is right and thus you just conclude they're talking about something else in which they could be wrong in and you've labeled them and you've categorized them uh, as as wrong in that area right so what i'm getting at is that most communication is miscommunication and by telling somebody that they're wrong you're just putting up more resistance try to see whether they're right and the perspective that they have is right in certain areas usually um there's areas where like i said where people might to you seem really wrong but there's areas where what they know seems right and one of the things that i try to do is I try to communicate and connect with people that don't see things my way because it forces me to think uh, in a way that I have to understand them to see where they're right. So even if I don't believe in somebody's ideologies like fully, I still make them feel valued and understood and, uh, and right because there is situations where they're right. And if I only take the time to understand where they're right, then it expands my mind further rather than looking for where they're wrong. Principle number three, if you are wrong, admit it quickly and empathetically. Uh, there's no use to try winning battles and taking both people down and then moving yourself away from your grand strategy. It takes a lot of energy to uh, argue and debate and fight with somebody. It takes far less energy. It just takes breaking of your ego to admit that you're wrong and that you've made a mistake and that you're willing to move on and uh, figure out an optimal solution. This also positions yourself as a leader in the other person's mind because you're not afraid to take responsibility and taking responsibility is a sign of leadership and it's something that's deeply admired by people and this is your opportunity to present that leadership uh, ability by empathetically saying that you're wrong. Step number four, principle number four, begin in a friendly way. One of the things that I like to do, and I deal with uh, clients, I deal with uh, employees, I deal with consultants, contractors, and you know things don't always go in a way where people are delivering things on point or they should be. And so I have these discussions every day that can might go down a direction of being confrontational and um, conflicting. And one of the things that I've gotten better at over the years is to frame the conversation in the beginning in a way where I bring really positive energy and vibe into it so it turns into an opportunity if things didn't go, like if, if somebody was doing a task and they didn't deliver it the way they were supposed to deliver it, I turn that conversation into an opportunity where the other person feels empowered and challenged uh, to figure out the solution and we're mutually on this journey together. And it all starts by uh, framing the conversation in the beginning in a non-confrontational way and that's done not just by the words that you use, but, but, but by the vibe and the energy that you present when you're having that conversation. Principle number six, get the other person saying yes, yes immediately. So this is called um, commitment and consistency in influence psychology persuasion, or uh, it's called congruence, or it's also known as uh, compliance and uh, or mini compliance in different psychological bodies of knowledge, whatever you want to call it. But essentially, the more you can get somebody to say yes to something, the more likely they are to continue saying yes. This is because it builds trust. So say you're going to ask somebody for a million dollars. If you ask them for a million dollars right in the beginning, um, it's too much of a commitment for them. So they haven't built that trust with you. So you have to actually uh, break it down into smaller steps and maybe you know ask for a thousand dollars in the beginning and then give them the return on investment uh, at whatever, 10, 15% and return them back their uh, uh, 1,500 or whatever the return is, uh, whatever the percentage is. And then thus they'll see that you're trustworthy and they'll be willing to invest more. So micro commitments, and this, is, this can be done within conversations, many different creative ways of doing it, but essentially it's not jarring to the senses and it's not uncalibrated. 
it's uh, systematically and smoothly uh, escalating the interaction into the outcome rather than uh, you know like doing it in a very jarring way which can actually create unnecessary resistance which actually set yourself back principle number six let the other person do a great deal of talking if you let the other person do a great deal of talking they're more likely to listen to what you have to say. And if they're more likely to listen to what you have to say, they're more likely to consider what you have to say as an alternate way of doing things. So by allowing somebody else, and I just got to plug in my laptop here, by allowing somebody else to communicate and express themselves in a way that um, they feel that they're understood by you, you're actually furthering the likelihood that when it does come time for you to um, when it does come time for you to present what it is you're talking about, that they're going to listen and consider it. Because as Stephen R. Covey says in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood. If another person feels understood, they're more open. If you just keep talking and talking and talking, um, they are closed off and you know although they might be listening to you that's not a way to effectively persuade effectively persuade is to get the other person to open up and um, by letting the other person talk you're not just getting them to open up but you're also getting them to reveal to you many different aspects of what they're thinking and what they're trying to do and then you'll be able to uh, take that information and communicate it back to them in different ways to help them hit that realization that you wanted to have to get that idea uh, uh, integrated that you're trying to get across. Um, let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. One of my favorite sayings from The Art of Seduction by Robert Greene is, uh, let the thoughts you are provoking <clears throat> excuse me, come to them as if they were their own. So a lot of times we want to be the one that gives the insight to the person. We want to be the one that actually created the breakthrough. But at the, the reality is that um, it's not that's just like an egotistical thing to do. What we want is to actually create the result. And it doesn't matter where the results come from. And a lot of people want to feel like they came up with it on their own. So even if you facilitated it, even if you did all these things in the background to help them get to this idea or realization, uh, and they want to feel that they came up with it on their own, let them. Make them feel good about it because the reality is the outcome. The reality is they hit that realization and that's what matters. It's not about, um, you know, again, egotistical reasons. You have to break your ego down if you want to be good when it comes to connecting with people because a lot of the resistance that we have when it comes to dealing and connecting with people is internal. It's just our ego. It's our wanting to be right. It's wanting to be the one that does the talking. It's the wanting to have them do uh, things our way, which is very nuanced because, you know, on one hand, we're talking about uh, how to persuade people and how to influence people. But on the other hand, we're talking about um, you know, not being a manipulative person. It's very, it's, it's very nuanced. But the, the power really lies in your ability to let go. And let go, and it may sound abstract, but just let go of certain things. Like number one, letting go of the want to, in, in relation to this point here, the wanting to be the one that is awarded with the creator of the breakthrough in them, right? It just as long as they get the result, and uh, which will free up your mind to be able to think of all kinds of different, more impactful, creative ways to facilitate that idea rather than, you know, your very rigid ways because you want to relate it back to you're the one that created the outcome in them. Um, allow that to happen in the other person and be open to it and re remove your ego out of the equation because you're more likely to increase the likelihood that you will create breakthrough thinking and different uh, ideas in a person and in a way that they feel that it's on their own. But the point is that you would have actually have created it even if they couldn't relate it back to you. Number eight, try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Okay, so when I'm talking about listening to people, don't listen with the intent to reply, but rather listen, to the, listen with the intent to understand them and see things from their point of view because it's actually mutually beneficial. The more you can... Uh, step back and listen to somebody's point of view, the more breakthrough thinking you can have, right? We always think that we know the right way, but the reality is there's so much um, nuance points to reality and, and how the world works and whatever the objective is. So 
Um, we want to expand our way of thinking. We want to benefit. It's far greater to expand your way of thinking than it is to just you know fire off breakthroughs to, to people because then you'll get even better at it. And actually, it doesn't really work in a way where you can just fire off breakthroughs in the people uh, because it, it, as we're discussing here, in order to create a breakthrough in someone, a lasting breakthrough in someone, and, and a new breakthrough, they have to feel that you're trustworthy and the way they feel that you're trustworthy is by you taking the time to understand their point of view, by hearing what they have to say and empath- empathetically uh, feeling what they have to say and making them feel that you understand them. Again, it's, it's more about how you make them feel than, than a logical way of, uh, of just kind of... This, this discussion is more emotional than it is logical is what I'm trying to get at, this point right here. Okay, so... Um, be very empathetic and sympathetic to their ideas and, and desires and uh, understand that it is really the key to having a breakthrough or helping somebody get a breakthrough. By taking the time stepping back, you're showing an enormous amount of confidence. It makes them feel safe. And also, it makes them feel like someone is actually going to take the time and value and walk them through the process like you've got all the time in the world which actually is a sign of confidence next principle number 10 and i think i went over principle number nine be sympathetic with the others person's ideas and desire i think um, it's very related to principle number eight as i said it's a lot a lot has to do with um, accepting people for who they are and understanding that their viewpoints are very much uh valid and valuable and true in their map of reality Right. And everybody's reality is different. And we're kind of living in a collective reality here. So uh, everyone's reality is valid. Okay, so I had to take a little break and we're going to move on to principle number 10. Appeal to the nobler motives. If you're trying to get somebody to do something, then what you want to do is you want to figure out how to tap into what they are interested in achieving in their overall life and relating your projects and your grand strategy to that and showing them how by applying the uh, steps in your project or completing the project, they will further their own objectives, either through realizations or development of skills that are universally applicable. There's so many different ways of doing it, but this again goes back to if you want somebody to do something, if you want somebody to be passionate about something, then they have to figure out and you have to help them, more importantly, figure out how to relate what they're doing right now as far as what you're telling them to do goes to their overall goals, to what they want in life. And this takes, again, going back to the earlier steps, a lot of listening, a lot of understanding. One of the things that I like to do whenever I bring on a contractor or a consultant or anyone is I want to take as much time as possible to learn about their goals and what they want to achieve in life, uh, employees, etc. I want to I want to learn what they're trying to do, what they're passionate about, because a lot of times what I'm passionate about is not necessarily what they're passionate about. So I can't try to connect it to what I'm interested in, but instead I got to take the time to find out what they're interested in. I listen, I ask a lot of questions because that later on I can connect the goals, the tasks, everything to the more nobler motives that relate to them. Next, dramatize your ideas. Don't just tell people what you want them to do and relate it quickly to the end result. Like, don't say, if you do these five steps, we're going to get this end result. Like, clear cut like that. What you want to do is add more story, dimension, and nuance. And during that story, the dimension and nuance connect it back again to their ideal outcomes and then break it down and then explain with a lot of passion and enthusiasm the steps and use diagrams, use examples and things like that to make it more multidimensional. Now, you don't do this with everyone the same way. So some people can benefit more from a storytelling example of your idea. Some people benefit more by showing them diagrams and pie charts and uh, and things like that. It's really understanding and knowing what to say, when to say, why to say it, and who to say it to. And again, this comes with experience. 
But overall, we tend to be too cut and dry of what we want people to do. And what we want to do is we want to be able to, when we're communicating with people, you want to see the engagement in their eyes and their body language. And you want to, like a maestro, be able to communicate what it is that um, you're trying to orchestrate in them in a way that's related to your goals. So if you're trying to get them to do something, observing what you say and having certain discussions as a result of the conversation you're having with them and their either engagement or lack of engagement, really gauging it and being present and uh, using different tools, like I said, visuals, uh, you know, breaking it down. There's a concept called chunking it down. Essentially, uh, it works like this. So chunking up would mean that you're trying to explain something at a higher level of abstraction. Like maybe you'd say, um, if we want to increase profits by 20% this year, then we're going to have to focus on online lead generation and conversion. That's a very, very high level way of explaining it. Uh, a chunk down version of that. And again, you have to be able to connect it with the group because some people you have to actually use that um, high level of abstraction because they'll understand exactly what the nuance points are and all the pieces they have to do to hit that objective. But with other members of the team, you might have to say, okay, so our goal is to be able to to increase revenues by 20% and we're going to use online a lead generation and conversion specifically using Facebook advertising. So in order to um, implement this, we need to go out and we need to find a firm that is good with Facebook uh, advertising. And here's the criteria and you start to break it down. And then while you're in there, you're explaining and relating it back to what they know, keeping them engaged. And there's many ways of doing the dramatize your ideas, but it's essentially knowing when to chunk up and when to chunk down. Principle number 12, throw down a challenge. So people are motivated by challenges and you want to make it a challenge, not an overwhelm. So uh, when somebody is working, we say you got a group of people working on a project for you, right? And this group of people are doing different things. Well, you need to take the time to figure out what makes the tasks that they're doing challenging and what makes the task overwhelming for each of them, or you have to assign that responsibility to your project manager. Because what happens is that by breaking down the tasks that they have to do and setting the bars so it's uh, just enough, it's challenging enough that they're very motivated and engaged, the entire project starts to move forward because you got everyone motivated and you got everyone engaged. And um, if it's too easy, they're just going to get bored. But if it's too hard, they're going to get distracted. Or if they don't have the tools, they don't have the resources, they don't have some type of guidance, again, they're going to get distracted and their mind's just going to wander because it's going to be too much. They're just not capable of executing upon what it is that you're outlining. So you need to take a step back. You need to realize like what are the challenging pieces that each of them have and you have to connect with them and you have to, you have to mention how overcoming these challenges will not only produce the results for the project, but will also help them in their own subjective uh, agendas and what they want to accomplish. Because remember, uh, and we're talking from a business perspective, but this works in many different areas of life. When people come together in a company or in a business opportunity or something like that, that you've created, um, they might get a salary or commissions or whatever it is that you're, you're offering them they have that mutual joint objective that they share with you, but they also have their own agendas and objectives and things that they want to achieve in their life. So it's more powerful to make the thing that they're after more of like a crusade to further the other areas of their life, not just the thing that you've joined forces together to do. And uh, relating it back to this point here, you want to break it down into little steps or maybe higher level steps, depending on who you're dealing with. Each is it's not one size fits all. Each person is different, but you want to create a challenge, a place of challenge and motivation and support. A good book that I'm probably going to do a book review on is uh, The Rise of Superman by Stephen Kotler. He talks about getting in flow state. Well, essentially, you want to get your team and those people working with you into flow state and flow state really occurs 
where challenge meets skill at a certain point where it's challenging, but there's just enough skills to be able to do it, but also learn in the process to further elevate the skills. If it's too challenging, like I said, then um, it's you're met with overwhelm. If it's too easy, then you're met with boredom. So next, we're going to talk about part four, how to change people without giving offense. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to facilitate behavioral change in people to help them, to grow them, to lift them up to the higher levels. And they want you to do it. And you got to be able to orchestrate this with them to be able to do it, to actually facilitate it. So here's some good principles to help you do this because if you can create that behavioral change in people, then they're going to get higher levels of results. And whatever it is that you guys are doing together, that's going to go to a higher level also. So principle number one, begin with praise and honest appreciation. Again, we brought this up early. Um, when you're creating behavioral change in somebody, you don't want to have a lot of resistance. You want to reduce the amount of resistance. By giving appreciation and praise to the things that they're good at, they're going to feel good around you and they're going to be more open for any type of constructive discussions or constructive criticism that's coming up that follows that which can be challenging to them, but it lays a good frame. Principle number two, call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. Try not to be confrontational and tell them that they're wrong, but explain. One of the ways that I like to do it is I like to tell stories and I like to give examples when I'm working with a client, for example, I like to give examples of other clients that have gone through the same thing in a way that my current client that I'm working with comes to the realization on their own that they should be doing that thing and they're making that mistake. And uh, that is a lot more palatable for them. Another thing that I like to do is I like to give my own experiences because when you give your own experiences of how you've overcome something, it gives you more credibility. Right. And again, you can say it in a way where, you know, there was a time where I had made this mistake and you don't say that they're making the mistake, but you talk about your own stories and they will connect the dots together. This is, is very indirect, but it's also very interactive. It's engaging because um, they know that you're you're pointing out the mistake, but you're doing it in a way where you're they feel like you're working together psychologically as a team. Principle number three, talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. Again, this is one of those things where uh, what you're trying to do is in a way show vulnerability, right? You're saying that, look, I'm not perfect. Um, I might be at this level, but believe me, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been there before. Here's what I'm doing to overcome it or here's what I've done to overcome it. And um, you're actually going to talk about your current mistakes right now and areas of your life you're trying to improve and try to get better at so that you don't come off as being superior and untouchable. And yeah, I essentially want to make, don't want to make people feel like they can't do what you're doing. They want to be able to, like when people who come off as being like too unapproachable and too high level, uh, the other person doesn't feel like they can do it. They feel like, oh, this is just like, you know, a special breed of person. So the more you can show vulnerability in like your body language, that's why like what I try to do is I try not to do things too perfectly and I make mistakes. And you know, some of my videos, you might even find like spelling mistakes. I just leave it in there or I'm just kind of dressed casually because what that does, I mean, there's a strategy behind it. And the strategy is, I mean, part of it is I like doing it that way. It's more laid back, but a part of the strategy is that uh, it shows vulnerability, it shows authenticity, it shows flaws. And it's, it's okay to have those flaws. It makes it okay. So when others uh, that you're dealing with make mistakes, they feel, hey, you know, um, you make mistakes, so it's okay for them to make mistakes. It's not about the mistakes, but the opportunity to resolve and prevent the mistake from happening again and the growth that comes from making the mistake and creating that safe place so they can uh, experience that. Principle number four, ask questions instead of giving direct orders. There's times where giving direct orders is appropriate. I give a lot of direct orders, but in order to get to that point, I build a relationship with them where I have gauged them and I have helped them understand that I'm a kind of person, I'm an ENTJ in Myers-Briggs, so I give very uh, clear direct orders. 
Uh, but at the same time, they understand and embrace why I do that because it's my personality type and we're also moving the objective uh, forward when you're giving more direct orders. But what I do is I, I build a relationship with them and go with the ebb of flow of the relationship until it gets to that point where you can be more direct. And uh, by asking questions instead of dire directing or uh, uh, giving direct orders, you're helping them facilitate uh, what they should be doing. And they usually know what to do, but they like to come up with the idea on their own. So I will like, you know, think like a billiards player. I mentioned this earlier. I would say, what do you think we should do here? And it's probably pretty obvious what you should do, but it's a lot smoother to say it that way and a lot less confrontational than telling them what to do. All right, principle number five, let the other person save face. If you try to publicly humiliate people and make people look bad in front of other people, then again, you're creating more resistance and it doesn't make the other person feel good and you'll just come off as being insecure and the kind of person that um, likes to put other people down to make themselves seem better. There's far better ways of doing it. One of the best ways to do it is to pull somebody aside when they make a mistake or they're like, this is, we're talking about like business and workplace here, pull them aside and have a discussion with them and not bring that mistake they made publicly so that they feel humiliated. In fact, a lot of people want to feel, I mean, all people want to feel that you are trustworthy and that if they can make a mistake in front of you, that you are not going to share it publicly. Instead, you're going to help them grow from it and you're going to do it privately and they can trust you and they're going to move forward like that. So be that kind of person that can offer that space to somebody instead of being the person that, um, you know, tries to like make the other person feel bad in front of somebody else. So resist the urge to do that. If you ever find yourself in a situation where uh, you're working with people and somebody makes a mistake, rather than you know, and making a mistake sometimes can be pretty humiliating for some people. Assume the leadership role by bringing the person aside, not bringing any attention and awareness on them, and then having a discussion and then showing them how they could resolve the matter and go back. And then uh, what happens then is that they will respect you even more. And again, they'll be more likely to implement your suggestions because um, the very fact that you are not bringing your ego into the equation by trying to make them look bad is very disarming and a very uh, rapport building. Principle number six, praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Uh, praise is important because when you praise somebody, it's kind of like they're getting a reward from it alongside whatever it is that you're giving them. When you praise them that they've made a step forward towards uh, a new strategy, a new way of doing things, and you recognize that praise, they're gonna feel good about it and they're more likely to want to do it again. But not only that, they're more likely to, to do the next thing you tell them to do because um, they're going to get this unconscious release of dopamine or whatever it is, chemicals that are released in the brain when somebody gets appreciation. And appreciation is a huge thing. So every time somebody makes a step in the right direction, when you appreciate them, they're more likely to take you up on the next thing again and um, you know break it down even doesn't have to be like the big things that you appreciate. It could be the small steps in between. In fact, it should be the small steps in between to that outcome that you appreciate because that's going to move it a lot faster. That's going to energize them and they're going to really like you and look up to you as a leader. Next, give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. So if you can picture, if you can picture in their mind this ideal, even if they can't picture it yet, this ideal person that they want to become. And a lot of times people haven't actually visualized what that ideal person is. If you can work with them at some point to imagine what it could possibly be, this outcome that could be really cool to experience. And then you add a lot of detail, vividness, you help them emotionalize that and uh, experience it, they're going to be very motivated. And then when you could show them how what it is that the idea that you have or what it is you're offering can help them achieve that faster then they're going to more likely comply with that because they're going to see the connections again this is not a manipulative thing this is an actual way of helping somebody understand about how what it is you're offering actually benefits them so i mentioned earlier that it's very important to 
always offer value in a way that benefits the person based on their goals and objectives? Well, part of it is coming from that place. And the other part of it is communicating that you do have that because a lot of people might not know how what you're offering, even though you're authentically trying to help them, is actually beneficial for them. They're not going to really know that. So you have to be able to communicate with them. And an, an, a great way to do it is uh, principle number seven is to paint this picture together of this ideal person and then show them all the steps of how to get there and uh, work with them to get there and you know, essentially hold them accountable and support them and offer them praise along the journey in micro steps. Principle number eight, use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. If somebody makes a mistake, you know, say, hey, you know, we all make mistakes and, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and this is just a small step uh, in the right direction, actually, because it's not a mistake because a mistake in a negative way is like that it would it, you get ridiculed for it or something, but you're not. A mistake is an opportunity to calibrate, to recalibrate. So you want to say stuff like that because now they're going to get excited to fail and fail fast. I mean, we don't want to fail in the long term, but understand that failing or our success in the long term is a result of a whole bunch of failures in which you calibrate from. So you have to give somebody encouragement and make them feel like it's okay that they can make mistakes. And then from these mistakes, we look at it and we say, what should we do better next time? And there's no defensiveness, there's no anger. It's just an objective thing that we have to do. Principle number nine, make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. So when somebody does the thing that you suggest, reward them, but not just in a way where it's manipulative. Again, you just, you're just happy when they do the thing that you tell them to do, but also show them how it furthers their objective. Actually quantifiably explain how by doing this thing, they actually now have made more progress give as many examples as possible because by doing that you're reinforcing that trust you're reinforcing that connection so this and uh, many other aspects of how to win friends and influence people is covered in this book in this video i'm just giving you my perspective and insights um, you might find a bunch of them to be quite different than in the book but however at a deep level it tends to, the essence is still the same. So I recommend reading this book multiple times. I remember I recommend watching this video multiple times. I also recommend that you take your own notes when you're implementing the principles covered in here because when you take your notes, you've got optimization points. When you're connecting with people in business, personal uh, areas of your lives, observe where you are doing and not doing this thing and observe how people respond to what you're doing and not doing, and even more importantly, uh, observe how you respond to their response, because a lot of times the way you respond, you could either resp respond in an empowering way or a very defensive way or a disempowering way. When you respond in an empowering way, you're more likely to analyze and study and reflect upon and do the right thing. Whereas if you look at it from a disempowered way, you're more likely to shut off blame the other person, not take responsibility, and not further deepen your understanding when it comes to uh, the depths of this book. I hope you enjoyed this video. Look forward to more videos that I've got coming out on the topics of communication, persuasion, uh, things like that. I will talk to you soon. Take care.